Good morning, everyone. And let me begin by thanking the People's Tribunal for inviting me to give testimony on this important occasion. My brief is to give you the political context of Sri Lanka, starting with the ethnic conflict to bring it up to date to the present day situation. So without much further ado, let me say that the 26 year old ethnic conflict was brought about largely because the majority community, the Singhala Buddhist community have been unwilling and unable to share power with the minority Tamil and Muslim communities. They have been unwilling to come up with a structure of governance which will share power and treat the minorities as equal citizens. They passed laws which discriminated against the minorities. And in particular, in 1956, you had the Singhala only, or Singhala being the language of the majority community, act by which it was made the official language of the country. That led to communal riots in 1956 and then again in 1958. In addition to that, any attempts by a government in power to make any political concessions to the minorities have resulted in the opposition playing the communal or ethnic card. And for years, we've had this situation when a party in power attempted to make any limited concessions to minority demands were blocked by the opposition and also taking that opposition into the streets as well. So attempts made in parliament by the political representatives of the Tamil community, as well as the predominantly singular governments failed considerably. The demand of the Tamil minority was for a federal constitution and that was rejected out of hand. In 1972, the government came up with a new constitution which made Sri Lanka a republic. Article two of that constitution makes Sri Lanka a unitary state and therefore closes the door on any kind of power sharing and federalism. Article nine went on to state that Buddhism, the religion, of the majority community will have the foremost place and that this will not be to the detriment nevertheless of other religions. So by 1972, we had constitutionally embedded a unitary state, the language of the majority community singular as the official language of the country and the religion of the majority community, Buddhism, being given the foremost place. From that point onwards, there were various incidents whereby the political representation of the minorities resisted all of this. There were bouts of communal violence, but it was only until the late 1970s that the guerrilla movement or the militant movement of the Tamil youth who in a sense were disenchanted with the previous generation's attempts in parliament to negotiate a political settlement of this dispute, took to arms and took to the street. In 1983, there was a particular incident which led to a major pogrom against Tamil citizens living in Colombo and living outside of the North and East where there is a concentration of the Tamil community. Something like over 3,000 people were burnt, killed, property ransacked, looted. All of that happened. And in effect, 1983 sort of marks the beginning of the armed conflict. On the Tamil side, there were something like 30 odd militant groups. But eventually, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam emerged after fratricidal killings, etc., as the most powerful force on the Tamil side to confront the Sri Lankan army. The question has arisen as to whether the Tamils in the North and East actually supported the LTTE, but I think the answer to that question is largely one of saying that they would have ac they accepted the LTTE as defenders against the Sri Lankan army 
and not rulers as such. The LTT has a reputation of being a very repressive and an organization that engaged in acts of terror. Their atrocities are, make up quite a large list, which includes both the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi, the Prime Minister of India, as well as, perpetually, the assassination of President Premadasa of Sri Lanka. Now, there were various attempts at negotiations, none of which succeeded. It was largely, I think, because of two things. One, the inability, the unwillingness of the Sri Lankan government to come up with a set of pro political proposals to resolve the issue, and on the LTT side, an unwillingness to accept anything short, not just of federalism, but of confederation that would lead to a separate state. All of this continues until the, the mid 90s where Chandrika Bandaranaika Kumaratunga becomes the president. And she becomes a president on the platform of reconciliation and of peace building Negotiations are started with the LTT. However, they break down and we go towards full-fledged war once again. However, the one distinguishing feature in this context of that government was that for the first time, the Sri Lankan government came up with a set of proposals, political and constitutional proposals to resolve the issue. They came up with a set of proposals that dropped the reference to a unitary state. They talked about Sri Lanka being a union of regions, but that too was brought to parliament but did not succeed because there were temporary provisions that provided for the president to continue in office and the abolition of the executive presidency to take place after she completed her term. So that constitution did not actually pass through parliament in August 2000. The war continues and we then get Norwegian mediated brokered talks between the two sides. In November, December of 2003, the LTT for the first time also agrees and the two sides come up with a statement saying that they are willing to explore a federal solution to the conflict. However, this is a government that is made up of President Kumaratunga from one party and Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe from another. Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe comes into office in 2001. By 2002, he signs a ceasefire agreement with the LTT. And as I said, by 2003, we have this political proposal to explore the possibilities of a federal situation. Now, the reasons for the two coming to the table to agree to a ceasefire with a Norwegian, largely Norwegian brokered uh, monitoring mission was that the LTT believed that they had earned themselves a place at the negotiating table and that the new government of Sri Lanka wanted to get the war out of the way so that it could pursue development in the South. The LTT assumed that the North and East of the country was being given to them on a platter. They proceeded to engage in a number of human rights violations, which brought that ceasefire into tremendous disrepute as far as the rest of the country was concerned. So by 2005, the war is really continuing. The ceasefire is really being broken. And in 2005, we have a presidential election between Mahinda Rajapaksa and Ranil Vikramasinghe. Now, in that presidential election, Ranil Vikramasinghe is seen as the peace candidate. But as far as elements in the singular South are concerned, he's also seen as pro-Tamil, pro-minority, pro-Western, whereas Mahindra Rajapaksa is seen as 
the true candidate of the singular Buddhist majority. Rajapaksa wins because the LTT declares in the North that there should be a boycott of the presidential election. I think there's a general consensus that if the Tamils were allowed to vote in the North, that Ranil Vikramasinghe would have won the election. But the boycott was enforced and pretty brutally in some instances, and Mahinda Rajapaksa emerges as the winner. The rationale of the LTT and the Tamil nationalists was that this should be an election where the Sinhala South decides who the president of the country should be, so that the rest of the world would realize the justice of their cause, because the Sinhala South would never agree to a just political settlement of the conflict. The Rajapaksa regime, though, continues with talks until 2006, when the LTT blocked the flow of water in the eastern province, the Marvel Aru Anikat was closed by them, resulting in, again, open warfare between the two. Now, the Rajapaksa regime was very much of a singular nationalist regime who then vowed to end the war. And I must say that they engaged in negotiations, but the LTT persisted in provoking them to come out and show what the LTT and the Tamil nationalists believed were their true colors. Mahinda Rajapaksa appointed his brother, Gotabe Rajapaksa, as the defense secretary. Gotabe Rajapaksa had served in the Sri Lankan army, but had resigned and he was in the States. He was brought back and made the defense secretary. The Rajapaksa regime in general was seen as a very nationalist, chauvinist, and a regime that was showing a lot of signs of authoritarianism with regard to any kind of dissent. And particularly dissent in terms of their perpetrated human rights violations, their attacks on the freedom of speech and assembly, and on journalists in particular. In January 2008, they torched the offices of one of the leading dissenting broadcasting corporations. And then we also had the murder of La Santa Vikramatunga. The Rajapaksas decided that they would spare nothing in the pursuit of military victory against the LTTE. We are told that the previous government of Chandrika Kumaratunga was also told that, you know, the war could be finished, but it would take X number of combatants on the government side, and it would result in X number of casualties on the civilian side. We are told that she refused to accept those costs. And therefore, the war continued in terms of skirmishes, battles, etc. But now, the Rajapaks has decided to increase the number of armed forces, engage in major militarization in terms of rearmament, and we have a war that was fought until May 2009, where a victory was secured, a military victory was secured against the LTTE. Now, the point that needs to be made was that Gotabe Rajpaksa, as the defense secretary, had the full power and authority of his brother. He could do whatever he liked and whatever he wished, both in terms of the conduct of the war and in terms of the suppression of dissent against the war and the other human rights atrocities of the Rajapaksa regime. But once the war was won, they became the great heroes of the majority community. 
in Gotabe Rajapaksa too, was seen as one of the leading architects of that victory. But that victory, although it was celebrated with great fanfare in the South, also was marked by human rights violations, which by now are well known. The killing of Prabhakaran, the LTT leader's son, the broadcaster, the fact that a number of people surrendered or gave themselves up to the Sri Lankan armed forces and have not been seen since. The continued use of the Prevention of Terrorism Act, the disappearances increased considerably. And as a consequence of all of that, the government came into disrepute to the extent that by 2012, we have the resolutions in the Human Rights Council in Geneva on Sri Lanka, calling on the government to fulfill on its pledges to look into instances of alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity, to come up with a political settlement, to come up with the process of transitional justice. That has continued in Geneva to the extent that now there is a unit in the office of the High Commissioner collecting information on war crimes and crimes against humanity. Rajapaksa wins a landslide in the 2010 election and then proceeds to institutionalize his platform of singular Buddhist hegemony. In the North and East, despite the promises of a political settlement, what we have is a large concentration of the armed forces, camps of the armed forces, armed forces setting, building temples and uh, setting up camps, armed forces taking land from innocent civilians, armed forces engaging in from private trade to growing agricultural produce, to selling it, to owning restaurants, to golf courses, and all of that. So they created the perception of being an army in occupation. Civil society in the North and East felt extremely subjugated and repressed. And even to this day, you have members of the Terrorism Investigation Department, the TID, the Criminal Investigation Department, Army Intelligence, constantly visiting them, asking them what they are doing, where do they get their funds from, why they are doing X, Y, and Z. So there is a sense of repression and closing of space as far as the North and East is concerned. The promises that were made, and this was to the UN Secretary General, as well as others internationally, to proceed with the process of transitional justice were never met. And the Rajpaksa regime was also accused of rampant corruption. And as a consequence of which, at the 2015 presidential election, where Rajapaksa, Mahinda Rajapaksa, attempted to run for an unprecedented third term, he was defeated by a member of his own party running as a joint opposition candidate, Michael Pala Sirisen. That government in 2015 won on a platform of promising accountability. In the South, it was with regard to the corruption, rampant corruption of the Rajapaksa regime, and in the North, it was largely accountability for war crimes and allegations of crimes against humanity. However, it was a joint opposition government. It was a government therefore made up of two parties who had been historic political rivals. And given the personalities of the president and the prime minister, there were bound to be problems in decision making. And indeed, there were serious problems. And a consequence of that, the government came to be seen as weak 
and indecisive. But more damaging was that whilst they launched investigations into the Rajpaksas, they didn't actually indict or convict anyone. And therefore, that gave rise to the perception that the political class in the country were complicit, irrespective of partisan allegiance. In addition to that, this government decided that it would accept the burden or the responsibility of engaging in a process of transitional justice. And the foreign minister promised four mechanisms to deal with transitional justice at the UN in Geneva. An office of missing persons, an office of reparations, a truth and justice commission, as well as an accountability mechanism, which would involve the proactive participation of international judges and prosecutors. However, they came back and they set up a consultative task force to find out what people thought about all of this. The task force too recommended that there should be an accountability mechanism with the proactive involvement of foreign judges and prosecutors. The government took up the position, as did the Rajapaksa opposition, that Sri Lanka's war heroes would not be turned into war criminals. And because of the accountability mechanism, the whole process of transitional justice, notwithstanding the establishment of an office of missing persons and an office of reparations, was put on the back burner. But what really created the crisis was the bombings, the atrocities by Muslim extremists on churches and hotels in Colombo in 2019, resulting in the loss of over 250 Sri Lankan citizens. Now this built up on two things. One was that there is evidence that the government was warned about this and did nothing. And therefore, that lends a certain amount of credence to the arguments that there was a political conspiracy which resulted in this atrocity. And secondly, it built up on the Rajapaksa's attacks, not now on the Tamil community, but on the remaining minority community in the country, the Muslim community. As a consequence, and as a consequence of COVID too, there have been a number of actions that have been taken against the Muslim community, which are openly discriminatory. There have been attacks during the first Mahindra Rajapaksa regime, and then subsequently on Muslim businesses. There have been Gobelsian type propaganda against the Muslim community. During COVID, there was a ban on burial, despite all expert medical evidence saying that burial was not in any way endangering people's lives. And we have continued with this sort of othering of the Muslim community as well. So as a consequence of the weakness and the vacillation of the government that came into power in 2015, the Rajapaksas formed a new party and they formed a network of, for their campaign of temples to win the 2019 presidential election with Gotabe Rajapaksa as the candidate. So in effect, Gotabe Rajapaksa wins that election with 6.9 million votes. It's a platform based on the politics of hate and hurt and harm. It is about singular nationalism. It's a platform that gains its legitimacy from those in robes as well as those in uniform. In addition to that, when he got into office, one of the first things that he did 
was he cut taxes, which has lost the Treasury millions and is a direct contributory factor to the current economic crisis. Now, Gotabe Rajpaksa has never been a politician. His only experience, if you like, of governance was probably commanding a platoon in the Sri Lankan army. And as a consequence, he has not been sensitive to what politics requires in terms of government and governance. He brought in a lot of ex-army people into government and as a consequence has institutionalized the role of the army in government. He has also said that he was bringing in experts from an organization called Vyat Magar. But these experts who have been brought tax base. There was also the announcement that Sri Lanka would move to organic fertilizer for agriculture, that we would move overnight. And as a consequence, it has created serious disruption in the food supplies. Gotabe Rajpaksa presents himself as a strong, decisive leader, but he has only spoken to the country in the current worst crisis of governance and the worst economic crisis the country has ever faced, only yesterday. He has flipped and flopped in terms of his decision-making in the course of his crisis. What is the crisis at the present moment? The crisis has many facets. The Rajapaksas have come to be identified with human rights violations, allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Mm. There are governments that have put travel bans on leading members of the Rajapaksa regime. <coughs> if they leave power, they will be extremely vulnerable to prosecution, to international jurisdiction, to prosecution. The shield of impunity that they have used will go. So they are fighting for their political survival, literally and metaphorically speaking. They have not created the economic crisis, but they have come to personify it because of the misdeeds, the rampant corruption, the insensitivity and arrogance that they have displayed and the lack of capacity to understand basic economic issues. So today the country is on its knees. We have an exchange rate where when they came into power, when Gotabe Rajpaksa came into power, it was 180 rupees to the dollar. And now it is almost 400 rupees to the dollar. We have no foreign exchange reserves. We insisted on using our foreign exchange reserves to pay back our creditors. And as a consequence, we didn't have any foreign exchange reserves to buy basic essentials from fuel to food. Colombo and the rest of the country are littered with queues for all of these things. The situation with regard to medicine is particularly acute. Now, as a consequence of this, People came out, spontaneously they came out and demanded that the Rajapaksas go. They demanded that President Rajapaksa resign, that the rest of his family also leave politics and that they bring back the alleged national wealth that they have stolen. As a consequence of this outpouring, 
And these were thousands of people at Golf Face Green in the middle, in the heart of Colombo. These were predominantly youth, but not exclusively. They were drawn from all ethnicities. They were drawn from all religions and all classes. And they have made this one persistent demand that still stands, that Rajapaksa should go. He shuffled cabinets, and on Monday, his brother, the Prime Minister, Mahindra Rajapaksa, eventually resigned. But before he resigned, he called a meeting of all his supporters, thousands of them, to Temple Trees, the official residence of the Prime Minister. They made inflammatory speeches. It was a situation somewhat similar to Donald Trump and the attack on the Capitol building in the Washington, D.C. His supporters marched on Golface and attacked unarmed, innocent protesters, burnt down the tents that they had built and whatever they had put up. However, public sentiment quickly switched and violence was then visited upon a number of Rajapaksa supporters. There were eight deaths, including one of a member of parliament from the ruling coalition. There, was how, there were houses and property of leading Rajapaksa supporters burnt. As a consequence, we had a curfew imposed. Earlier on, he introduced emergency rule. Now, sorry. No, 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 just I don't know if you were done or not. Sorry. No. Now we have a situation in which Sri Lanka has no government. There's only the president in office. He has to find a prime minister who will take on the role and set up a new cabinet. We are supposed to be having negotiations with the IMF, but those are stalled because there isn't a government to deal with. Yesterday, he promised that he would appoint a new prime minister and that he would reintroduce the 19th Amendment of the previous government, which introduces checks and balances on the exercise of the executive presidency and that he would allow them to eventually move towards the abolition of the executive presidency. The opposition's argument is, is that they will not join any cabinet which has a Rajapaksa or any cabinet which has Gotabe Rajapaksa as the president of the country. So, as a consequence of their greed, as a consequence of their insensitivity and arrogance, as a consequence of their lack of capacity to understand basic economics and their total denial of human rights and their tremendous involvement in the violations of human rights, the Rajapaksas have brought this country to its knees. We cannot resolve this question without seeing them out of politics. And that is, in effect, the stalemate or deadlock that we have. We can't get out of the economic crisis unless he goes. We can't resolve the political crisis unless he goes. We can't begin to establish serious structures and processes and institutions of governance until they're out of politics. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bakasotti. I have a two-pronged question. This is Almudena Arnabe speaking in the prosecution. Um, we talked about, um, well, there's a number, a, an official number of 44, we could bring it back to the, the, the sector, the journalists, the, the repression of dissidents and freedom of, of press and speech. We talk about, I mean, there's a number of 44 journalists killed in Sri Lanka since 2000. And it's a two-prong, because I wanted to, if you could, walk us a little bit through 
that uh, perhaps decade as of today, and when in different moments, what was the situation of journalists, and if it increased or decreased, or it became more uh, dangerous at times? I mean, what the situation was, was constant, or to some extent, um, what differ from different periods? And then also the second part of the question is, what's the situation of the press today? From 2019, since the Red Pax has managed to get back to power and in the current, uh, around the current events. Thank you very much. Well, the situation of the, of the media and the situation with regard to freedom of expression was particularly bad during the Raj Paksa years. That is from 2005 to 2015 and now from 2019 onwards. The situation today has been considerably changed because of social media. Social media has opened up a space for dissent. And indeed, even during the latter years of Mahindra Rajpaksa's presidency, dissent moved from print and electronic media largely to the net. Yeah. So what we have was therefore a situation in which any criticism of the armed forces any criticism of the government in terms of conducting the war and in the post-war phase was seen as subversive. And therefore, those who practiced it were either beaten up, abducted, or killed. Now, because of social media, it's a lot, lot more difficult to control that. And it is indeed surprising that Gotabe Rajpaksa, who comes in with 6.9 million votes in 2019, mm -hmm. by January, February 2021, has a lot of criticism, even caricature on social media. And that this notion that, you know, he was the person who was behind mm -hmm. the white vans by which people were abducted and that he was to be feared, that seems to have gone completely. And now the situation is much more freer. We also have a right to information regime installed because the legislation was passed by the previous government. So the situation from 2005 to basically 2015 was one of repression. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. I don't know if the panel of judges may have some questions. Yeah, good morning. Um, uh, my name is Kalpana Sharma from India. So what I'm trying to understand is you're saying now that, uh, that the digital space has opened up um, for dissent. But does this mean that in Sri Lanka, they're not monitoring journalists who are writing for these digital platforms? I'm asking you this because in India, even though it's opened up, there is there are laws now. And anybody posting even on Facebook, any kind of dissent can be picked up. So are you saying that in Sri Lanka, at least for the moment, that space is there and journalists who are writing for digital news platforms, for instance, uh, are not under scrutiny and are not under danger of being picked up if they are uh, writing critically about the government? Well, they are monitoring. They definitely are monitoring. There is surveillance. But they haven't succeeded in suppressing or getting rid of the wealth of criticism and dissent that one can find on social media. Because, you know, in addition to the bona fide journalists, we have the notion of citizens' journalism, where ordinary citizens are reporting on what's happening in the country and are providing their opinion in this digital space. So whilst they are monitoring, it's not that easy to shut them down. May I ask a question? Sure. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, your uh, very clear and uh, wide um, uh, the framework of the situation you exposed. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, beside the journalist and beside the cases we are going to take up in this tribunal, uh, what about the civil the civil society? Were there voices in the civil society? Are there human rights defenders or um, social activism or labor activism or any kind of social um, uh, activism or uh, organization in the civil so in the civil society, uh, were there any voices to question these, uh, as you describe it, this nationalist the chauvinist regime? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There have been civil society activists. There have been trade unions uh, who have come out and spoken. And as a consequence, we've received death threats. We've had on state-owned media campaigns of character assassination. Some of us have been detained. Some of us have been disappeared. All of that has happened. I mean, I myself have had death threats. I myself have been questioned. So yes, all of that has been done. But that has not stopped us from speaking truth to power, I suppose. Thank you. I do have a follow-up question, if that's all right, to your last answer. Could you describe what is the situation? I understand the social media playing a, a peculiar role in making it more widespread, perhaps the dissenting and the criticism, and in a way shields traditional outlets. But the attacks and the harassment to those more traditional outlets and journalists and investigative professionals remain have increased, if you have um, information about that? Well, I mean, they have increased insofar as they, whenever emergency is declared, they come up with uh, various ways in which people have to be a lot more careful and considered in what they report. Yeah, there are certain journalists who have felt the greater brunt of interrogation, of surveillance, and where their personal property has also been attacked. Yeah, so that situation has continued, but I guess it's been halted now because of the protests. And I don't think it can continue unless the protests are smothered by army intervention or, you know, basic authoritarian practices of the regime with the collusion of the military and the security forces. But yes, journalists, both print and broadcast journalists, are under continuous surveillance. And if they step out of line, they are brought back into line by threats, by interrogation, all of that. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. Sorry, I have one more question, which is um, with regard to Tamil journalists. Yeah. So I want to know whether, I mean, post-war, and particularly in the period you're referring to um, up to 2015, and perhaps even to the present day, uh, what is their situation? Because that would still be very specific to what is happening post-war in the North and the East. And maybe not enough is being talked about uh, their situation. And uh, it would be good for us to just in terms of a perspective to understand, um, you know, independent uh, publications as well as digital news platforms coming out of the North and the East. Are they under particularly uh, a greater surveillance because they're of their location? Uh, how, how, how has all this affected them? Thank you. In general, the North and East and all activism 
journalism, all of that, the situation has been worse. But at the same time, it's probably underreported. Thirdly, when we have lobbied in Geneva at the Human Rights Council, etc., we lobby on the basis of information that is given to us from the ground in the North and East. And so I think the government has come to recognize that these people are providing information that is becoming international. Yeah, so in general, the situation is a lot worse across the board as, as far as the North and East is concerned in comparison with the rest of the country. Uh, I have uh, a question, if I may. Uh, thank you for your uh, very comprehensive uh, introduction for us. Um, I was interested in your um, statement that the uh, current um, mass movement in uh, in Colombo uh, is covering, as you said, all, all ethnicities, all religions, and all classes. And I was wondering if you could just expand on that a little bit. In particular, has there been a, a, any under, uh, understanding or any uh, revelation of an understanding of the need for uh, Tamil um, demands to be met uh, among the uh, Sinhala uh, protesters? Uh, I'm interested in what has seemed to happen in Myanmar where the current um, uh, movement has indicated uh, a much more um, progressive view towards Rohingya and Muslim minorities than previously had been the case in the Burma community. And I'm wondering if we see any indications along those lines. And the second part of my question is, um, what is happening outside Colombo? We see what's happening at Goldface, but uh, is there any uh, movement in other in other cities and also in particular in the north as well? Thank you. Yes, the protests are island wide. Absolutely, the protests are island wide. Colombo is probably the largest single concentration of protesters, but they are island wide. In the North and East, there is probably less enthusiasm in terms of the numbers of demonstrators and all of that, largely because they have gone through this for 26 or 30 years of civil war. Secondly, there is also an element of, yeah, now the singular people are suffering, but we were suffering for 30 odd years, and where were you? Thirdly, there's also the question that people get remittances from relations outside. And with the exchange rate, they're not doing too badly as a consequence. Yeah. So with regard to the North and East, they are used to this hardship, but nevertheless, they have come out in protest as well. As far as the question of a political settlement of the ethnic conflict is concerned, yes, it is there when they talk about constitutional reform, when they talk about political reform, it is there. But it's not at the forefront of the protesters. At the forefront is the demand for the Rajapaksas to leave and the demand with regard to their financial corruption. Thank you very much. I think we I think we finished with that question. Thank you again. Thank you.